The third video in second order modelling <coughs> looks at mass spring dampers attached to a pulley or gear. So we're going to assume that students have already been through the video on mass spring damper systems and are confident with that. And what we will do here is we're going to introduce a pulley. Now, why are we going to do that? Because pulleys, or equivalently, you could might want to call this a gear, are ubiquitous in real systems and students really need to know how to deal with them. First a reminder then of the mass spring damper model covered in video one. Here you can see the diagram on the left and you remember what we did is we split the forces into the bits going through the mass, the spring and the damper and wrote down component equations for each of those forces. Then we used force balance that is, we added all the forces together, and essentially that gave us the model, which is the one down here. Now, what changes if we introduce a pulley? So you'll notice the diagram looks very, very similar. What we've done, if I put the circle over here, is we've added a pulley on the right-hand side. So you can imagine whatever is supplying the driving force to the mass spring damper, it might be a chain or a wire or something like that. First of all, it goes round this pulley. Now, what's the consequence of that? <coughs> well, a pulley or a gear is going to have some inertia. Now, if it was a gear, you need to remember this gear could be connected to something larger. And this larger thing may well have inertia. And as a consequence, when the chain or the wire which is exerting this force F moves, it will accelerate the gear and the associated inertia and therefore some of the force will be used up in accelerating that inertia. Now why is that important? Because you'll notice we've got a force here on one side and a different force on the other side. So the difference between these two forces, F minus F4, is what is being used to accelerate this pulley or this gear. So having explained that, we now want to say, OK, how do we model the overall system? Now, you'll notice there's a balloon here reminding you of something important. Whenever you do these figures, make sure that you fully annotate them. So I'm going to put in here displacement x for the mass spring damper. And clearly, if you assume this chain doesn't extend or this wire, you've got the same extension x at the other end of the pulley. But what we might want to do is recognize that the pulley is moving through an angle theta. And if you understand your rules of circles, you'll see that x equals r theta, where r is the radius of this pulley. So let's move on to the modeling. All we're going to do is exactly the same as we did with the mass spring damper system. So I'm going to start by looking just at the mass spring damper. That's this bit over here. So again, we mark in our displacement x. We look at all the component forces in each of the elements and we write down the equations. So the force in the damper, F1 equals B dx dt. The force in the spring, F2 equals Kx. The force accelerating the mass, F3 equals m d2x dt squared. And the overall force, which is being broken into F1, F2 and F3, here's the force balance equation, F4 equals F1 plus F2 plus F3. So that's the same as we did for the mass spring damper system. So next, we want to look at the pulley part over here. And again, you're reminded that this has the same extension x, and x was r theta. <laughs> So here's the equation for the acceleration of the pulley. We've got F minus F4 times R, which is the radius, so that's the torque supplied, is J, that was the inertia, times D2 theta dt squared. And a reminder of the relationship between X and theta, X equals R theta. So we've got an extra couple of equations compared to what we had just for the mass spring damper. How are we going to solve these then? So what we propose is first eliminate the angle, that's this theta, using this equation at the bottom, and then eliminate all the internal forces, so F1, F2, F3, and F4, to see what we get left with. So we're going to do that on the next page. So we've rewritten the equations here, so this is no different. Those are the same six equations we just had. So first of all, we're going to use this equation here. F4 
equals f1 plus f2 plus f3 and simply substitute in for f1, f2 and f3 and therefore you see we get this equation here your standard mass spring damper equation except the applied force is f4. Now we also said we wanted to remove theta x equals r theta so if I put this theta in here where I've got j2 j d2 theta dt squared you'll see that that equation the f minus f4 times r equals j d2 theta dt squared becomes this one here you'll notice all I've done is replace theta by x so I've got f minus f4 times r equals j over r times d2x dt squared now hopefully the last change is obvious I've got an f4 here and I've got an f4 here so I'm simply going to substitute that f4 into there so when I do that I get f equals j over r squared d2x dt squared plus m d2x dt squared plus b dx dt plus kx or grouping terms together f equals j over r squared plus m d2x dt squared plus b dx dt plus kx and you'll notice this is very similar to the original mass spring damper problem the only difference is this term here because of the pulley the term multiplying the second derivative is now j over r squared plus m rather than just m but it's still a simple convention second order differential equation so what have we got adding this inertia or this gear basically is like adding an additional mass and so the arrangement up here which we've given shows you that that gear essentially acts equivalently to a parallel arrangement because the gear has got the same displacement as the other components and the force is shared between all four components. Now a question that you might want to ask and this is quite important as an engineer is what's the effect of changing the radius r because that's what gears are all about when you use them in cars and bicycles and everywhere else. What essentially you're doing is you're changing the radius r. So let's have a look at the impact that has on our model and we're going to do that by using a simple bicycle example. So here's a picture of a rather messy bicycle but the thing that you really want to look at is over here you'll see there are some gears and you'll notice here's the chain which is supplying the driving force to those gears. Now what's most important is if you've got typical bike these days there are a multitude of gears on the back wheel and those gears have different radii and that's what we want to explore so those of you who have cycled will realize as you change gear it changes how the bike behaves how the bike feels and essentially all you're doing is you're changing the radius so we want to explore what impact that has and try and understand why does the bike work the way it does based on modeling principles now here's a keynote when you change gear in a bike you are not changing the inertia of the wheel or the overall inertia that you have to drive the mass of the cyclist or anything like that so that's an important point I can change the radius without changing the inertia so if I look at the original equation I had and just postulate some different values of r and you see I've just r equals 1 r equals 2 r equals 3 these numbers are a bit arbitrary and then look at the term I had in the differential equation there it is j over r squared plus m what you notice is that as I change r the term here changes in magnitude so as I increase r the term gets smaller so it feels like I'm accelerating a smaller mass so a bigger radius and the impact is I'm accelerating a smaller mass so increasing R reduces the effective overall inertia and thus you'll get faster acceleration but I've noted a key point here what you're getting faster acceleration of is the distance X which in the bicycle example is actually how far the chain is moving because the movement of the chain is what we defined as X now notice however x over r equals theta so you need to be a little bit careful here because just because the chain is moving faster or further doesn't mean you're getting more rotation of the wheel because the rotation of the wheel is given by x equals r theta now let's have a look 
at uh, the bike in a bit more detail. If I do a schematic diagram of what actually is going on, you'll see that the cyclist exerts a pedal force, which is going to be turned into a torque. This essentially puts a force on the chain, which drives the rear gear, and then that torque apart from the fact it's going to accelerate the wheel a bit, but actually the inertia of the wheel is relatively small compared to the other things, it's going to get torn, turned into a force on the road, which accelerates the mass of the cyclist. And you've got a number of different variables going in here. You've got the wheel diameter, you've got the diameter of the front gear, you've got the diameter of the rear gear, there's going to be some friction, etc, etc. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this because what you'll notice is the overall notion and model of a bike is a little bit more complex than a simple mass spring damper system and it's not something we want to solve here. But what you might want to do is prove to yourself, because this is important, that lowering the gear, which essentially means increasing its radius, leads to a faster acceleration on the road for the same applied force. Because that is a useful insight as an engineer. Now another thing you might want to think about is energy balance. I know these videos haven't really looked at energy, but if you think about what's happening, when the cyclist lowers the gear, it means that the chain has got to move faster in order to get the same wheel angular velocity. Okay? Now, the power supplied by the rider is the chain speed, so how fast the chain is moving, because that's related to the speed the feet are moving, times the force applied. So if the chain is moving faster, and the force is the same, then the cyclist is supplying more power. And so the key thing is that in lower gear, because the chain speed is faster, the cyclist can supply more power for the same force. Now, obviously they are going to get tired if they're supplying more power, but there's a key observation for you. At lower gear, you can supply more power because the force you can supply is fundamentally limited. Now a summary. What this video is really focused on is just understanding the basic principles of pulleys and gears. And what you'll see is we've just add a pulley or a gear on the end of a mass spring damper system. We still get a second order model, but essentially what happens is we get a change in inertia. And what you might want to consider in the longer term is how changing the gearing, changing this radius, has an impact on behaviour, because that's a skill you'll need in life.